Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Midland Cultural Center and welcome to A Day in the Life. Now, here is the host of A Day in the Life, Fred Hacker. Well, good evening. The best seats in the house are empty. What's wrong? You must all be Canadians. That's, I've, I've never seen that. You guys are the only people courageous enough, and you sat in the worst seats in the front row. <laughs> you should move over. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're really glad to see all of you here. Um, this is a program we've been doing now for more than 10 years. This is our 135th program in this series. Thank you. Sherry and Wayne wondered why I waited so long <laughs> to invite them. Uh, we, the program is sponsored, and we have two sponsors. We actually have a season sponsor, and then we have a show sponsor. And our season sponsor is Bales Dishon Holloway. They are portfolio managers at RBC Dominion Security. They provide wealth management services and strategic advice to their clients. And I believe that Michelle Deschamps is here, and I think Jeff Holloway is here, and I would ask them to stand up and accept our thanks for your sponsorship. <laughs> now, we also have two show sponsors tonight, and I'm sure you're not familiar with either of them. One of them is the Penetanguishing Curling Club, and the other is the Midland Curling Club. And there may be somebody here from one or the other of those clubs. Would everybody that has anything to do with either of those curling clubs please stand up? <laughs> Thank you very much. That's great. That's great. We've never had so many sponsors. <laughs> well done. Well, I don't think I need to do anything to introduce our guests to you, do I? You probably know them better than I do, but I'm going to know them better by the end of the evening. Please welcome Sherry and Wayne Madaw. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Have a seat. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank you for being here. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> so what we try to do with this program is to inspire our audience by hearing about how you have built such successful careers. Uh, and we do that in part by talking to you about the inspirations in your lives. So as we go through, I'm going to be asking you about the inspiration that, uh, that you took from parents, from school teachers, from employers, and that sort of thing. So, uh, but we'll begin with early days. <laughs> Just yesterday. Yesterday, <laughs> yeah. Where were you born, Sherry? I was born in a rural Saskatchewan town called Rosetown, probably population about 2,500. And somebody whistled, so there's somebody here from Rosetown tonight, <laughs> obviously. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. And Wayne? Brampton, Ontario. Brampton, Ontario. Yeah, and there was a, a one-handed applause there. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody thought they were from Brampton, but remember they weren't. <laughs> yeah. So I want to um, talk about, um, begin, be, begin talking about your parents and the influence that they have on you. And I have to show this, this slide. Aw, <laughs> that's Wayne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look like Wayne's eyes, Gary. <laughs> These are your parents? Yes, yeah, Jim and us? Marilyn. Jim and Marilyn, mm -hmm. okay. And uh, where, where did they grow up? Uh, Rosetown. Rosetown, Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same community. And uh, I understand that your family home was close to the most important institution <laughs> in town? Yes, the, the hockey curling rink, about, <laughs> a, about a half a block. Right. And where did you get your athleticism from? Which of these two folks? Definitely my mother. Your mother? Yes. Okay. My, my dad is book smart, but mother is very athletic. Okay. Good. And Wayne, tell us about... Uh, now, you were telling me about your grandfather, who's kind of famous. Yeah, he's a lacrosse Hall of Famer. Um, he's just a uh, Canadian Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, just a crazy competitive person. And uh, I spent a lot of time with him, as both my mom and dad worked. And he lived next door. So pretty much every day was with my grandfather, and he wasn't afraid to uh, beat the grandchildren as much as he could oh, <laughs> in any sport. 
Isn't that surprising that you'd be next door to somebody competitive and none of that rubbed off on you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, is your mom athletic? Yeah, my mom and dad are both somewhat athletic. Yeah. Um, they're, both, they're both very good athletes and they're both super competitive people and, uh, yeah. and in different ways. But uh, my grandfather was the one that would just played every sport under the sun and, and introduced uh, his four grandchildren to every sport under the That's sun. That's great. Yeah. Now, your dad's story is an interesting one. I want to take a minute and just have you tell us about the way he worked his way through life because it's quite intriguing to me. <laughs> yeah, Fred. I, I still am amazed at uh, what my dad accomplished in his life with everything he went through. Uh, uh, one of 12 kids, a very large family in Riverview, Ontario. Um, they were just a little bit poorer than dirt poor. And he left home when he was 14 years old. Wow. Lied about his age so he could get a job driving a gravel truck. <laughs> he got hired driving a gravel truck and lived in a motel. Actually, the, the motel is still there in Brampton. In, uh, by himself at 14 years old, wow. driving a gravel truck. And just un unbelievable what he accomplished from there. Um, my sister was born when he was 18 years old, and he was rushing with a load of gravel, rolled the gravel truck, and lost his job. Mm. <laughs> so so he has a baby, and he's unemployed. Yeah, at 18, and no education. And no education. And it just so happened that uh, his father-in-law was uh, had connections in Brampton, and... Uh, and got him a job at the fire department. While at the fire department, had another child, which was me, uh, f went back, finished high school. After high school, you, things got a little bit older, went back, university, graduated university. Wow. Uh, left the fire department, got onto the police department in Brampton, which was Peel, and, and just growing like crazy. Uh, from there, became a detective and inspector. Eventually got drafted by Washington and uh, a graduate of the FBI Academy in Washington. Wow. Uh, and then uh, became police chief. And he was chief of uh, Hamilton, chief of York Region, and deputy chief of Halton Region. Wow. So quite a career for a that's kid who a, left home at 14 years arc. old. Yeah, I mean, we, we hear a lot of inspirational stories, but that one is, mm -hmm. that one is great. Thank you for that's a up. That's a never give up kind of guy. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. great. So a different kind of competitiveness for yeah, sure. That's yeah, great. that's great. stick to Yeah. 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 Um, let's talk about school days. Uh, Sherry, um, anything stick out in, in your elementary school days? Any teachers that had an impact on you? Um, definitely. I had some tremendous teachers. Uh, ones that I, in, in small town Saskatchewan, but uh, one of my fondest memories is a Mr. Friesen, who I still talk to today. He really? taught grade five, and then when I graduated and we moved up to grade six, he actually advanced with us. Um, just such an inspiration, just loved life. I think we did like all our classes outdoors and he just, he, he just had fun, loved teaching. And that just instilled that in, into my day. You just have fun with everything that you do. That's great. Wayne, uh, you, you, uh, how did you feel about school? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not sure where it was. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to follow in my dad's footsteps, but I, I, never, <laughs> I never made it back and was never drafted by the FBI Academy. So <laughs> for some reason, here I am. <laughs> but you, you, you got through. You, I did. Yeah. I, I learned how to build relationships with teachers at a young age. Yeah. Uh, I was very fortunate that uh, a curler uh, would just happen to be the principal of our high school and a gentleman by the name of Russ Jackson, who a lot of people might know as a CFL quarterback. And uh, he supported my curling and pushed us along and, uh, and helped us out, but uh, just built a relationship with him and uh, he just made sure we kept going forward and finished school and did all the right things. So this is the Russ Jackson. This is the Russ Jackson. Canadian icon. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Now, Sherry... Um, you did your um, primary elementary school in Rosetown. Correct. But then you moved to the big city. I did the big city of Saskatoon, which, I mean, isn't big in comparison to Toronto, but it is in Saskatchewan. It yeah. was 200,000 people. That was huge. And what was that like for you? Uh, a bit overwhelming, um, especially I moved in my 12th year. Uh, so my, my classes in Rosetown, I think we would have maybe had 40 students in one grade, and we had over 300 in my graduating class. Oh, so wow. needless to say, I was just feeling a little out of place. A little overwhelmed. Yeah. yeah. Was there a teacher um, in your secondary school that 
made an impact on you or played a role in your well, development? I mean, I was only in, in the high school for one, one year, but then transitioned to university in, in Saskatchewan, like in Saskatoon. And so that wasn't that big of a transition coming from a big high school. But I just remember because I was a curler and um, I know I was, uh, you know, I remember uh, my first day in, in uh, high school, the curling coach dragged me out of English and said, you curl. Like he just was amazed. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, doesn't everyone curl, but not in the big city of Saskatoon. Uh-huh, uh-huh, good. Wayne, you mentioned that you uh, learned the art of negotiation and building relationships. Um, you had an English teacher who uh, took an interest in you for reasons other than your academic prowess. Yeah, Fred, uh, it was fully entertaining is that, uh, again, I didn't attend school often. <laughs> and uh, I spent most of my time at the golf course or the curling club or the hockey rink or the baseball diamond or football, whatever. And uh, I also worked three part-time jobs so that I could pay for my membership and my parents' membership at uh, Brampton Golf Club. And you couldn't be a junior member unless your parents were members. So your parents didn't My golf? parents had no idea that they were members of the club. <laughs> no idea. Never even crossed their mind, but they were paid memberships. And, uh, and my first cousin, Peter Corner, did the exact same thing. So we had ah. somebody to golf with. And uh, when this English teacher one day found out that I was a member of this club, he was a golf fanatic. And he said, would you take me out? Because he couldn't get on. And so one, uh, one day I took him out to play golf at a nice club in Brampton. And, uh, from then on in, I had no issues saying to him, oh, by the way, I'm not going to make class today. I got a 2 o'clock <laughs> tea time. He's like, have a great round. See you later. Here's your homework. <laughs> great role model for our kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hard to tell the kids. It yeah. served me well. <laughs> Sherry, what kinds of uh, out-of-school activities would you have been involved with as a, as a teen? We know about curling. Were you involved in other sports? Pretty much every sport. Again, growing up in a small town in Saskatchewan, if you didn't play a sport, they couldn't field a team. So, you know, I wasn't great at sports, but definitely participated and had fun. And that's basically how you filled your time. Yeah. Um, didn't get into a lot of trouble because busy doing sports before and after school and traveling on weekends. So you name a sport, we pretty much did it just so that we could play. <laughs> Wayne, I suspect you were the same. You name it, if, if the sport existed, we played it. We tried it, we did it. And the Madaw family, like my dad's side of the family, most of them were in Brampton and some fantastic athletes on that side of the family. We had uh, Major League Baseball pitchers. We had lacrosse players, hockey players. So again, it was a competitive side of the family, but somebody was good at every sport. So there's no lack of competition that way. Now, curling wasn't your first sport. No, it was not. What was? Hockey. I was born raised hockey player and lacrosse player. That's what we did in Brampton. And Brampton Excelsiors were a huge lacrosse team. So, yeah. And with the grandfather that was a, a Man Cup champion and a Minto Cup champion and a Hall of Famer, you, you played lacrosse. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but hockey was a big part of it. And uh, hockey was, was my whole life. Right, right up until I was about 16 years old, I was, I was playing rep hockey in Brampton. And I knew I wasn't going to be, I'm not an NHL level player, but I, I was okay. And uh, the coach actually, we won a big curling event, which had me going to Switzerland the same time as the hockey playoffs. And this was my first curling event I ever won. And uh, at the same time, you the hockey- make a choice. Yeah, so the hockey coach sits me down and says, okay, you know, you can't have these two weeks off. This is the playoffs. We're gonna go to Sudbury. Then we gotta go to North Bay. We gotta get this stuff done. He says, you're gonna have to decide whether you wanna play hockey or you wanna curl. Yeah. And back then, I'd, curling was not the most masculine sport to be part of, and you probably took a little bit of ribbing. But I honestly thought about it for 30 seconds, and I thought, hmm, I could travel to North Bay with 21 guys, or I could go to Switzerland with four teenage girls. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a real easy decision, and it was a good one I made. <laughs> good for you. Good for you. Let's talk about your post-secondary. Um, Sherry, where did you attend university? U of S, University of Saskatchewan. Yeah, physical education. And what education. did you major in? Physical education, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. there's a theme here. A little bit of a theme, yeah. yeah. And uh, your, your college w would have been, was it a separate college in the university? Yeah, um, each college pretty much had their own building. Uh, the, univer or the physical education building was like an old hangar. It was just this little itty, itty bitty building. But I just remember um, spent a lot of time. Again, you know, you, you did like uh, in 
intramural sports, right. um, attended classes, but did a lot of stuff, yeah. you know, curling for the university team and yeah, had lots of fun. Great, great. I attended classes though. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that is a difference. <laughs> Wayne, you uh, did post-secondary at Humber College? I did. I was uh, one of the very first people to do the professional golf management program mm -hmm. uh, back in mid-80s. It, uh, it was an apprenticeship program with the PGA, so it was a combination of the PGA of, of Canada and uh, the Humber College. So I was right at the end of one and the beginning of the other and actually have some type of diploma in professional so would there golf be management. So would there be coursework or was it an apprenticeship? No, it was actual coursework. Coursework. And we had some, some unbelievable courses that I still look back on to this day. Yeah, you did one day you might have done regripping, which was a pretty simple course. But another day I, I still remember to this day is, is they asked us to go out and secure a $100,000 loan to finance your pro shop. And that wow. was a, a great educational experience yeah, to actually okay. have to put that all together. Yeah. It, was, it was actually very interesting and still to this day it, it can be handy. Good for you. Yeah, interesting. Well, I think there's a couple of people in the audience who have an interest in curling. I, I gathered that when we uh, asked the, the curlers to stand up. So what age did you start curling, Sherry? Uh, about the age of 10. We didn't have little rocks like they do. Um, so, you know, 10 years old, not very big, but pretty much, uh, again, half a block from the curling club, age of 10. Mm -hmm. And Saskatchewan at that era was really top of the heap in curling, was it not? It was. I think just very rural communities, uh, not a lot to do in the, the cold minus 30 winters out there so you either played hockey or you curled and um yeah back when i was growing up saskatchewan won most of championships mm -hmm. i remember the richardson yes. rink yeah. uh, which seemed to just always win yeah family of four brothers and yeah. yeah yeah interesting so when when did you first get introduced to a rock <laughs> i was introduced at a very young age as my the same grandfather when he retired and took care of us he became the manager ice maker of the Brampton Curling Club. Okay. But uh, very big letters. You were not allowed on the ice until you were 12 years old. Mm. So 12 years old, uh, <laughs> we were the first time on the ice. But until then, that's, uh, the curling club happened to be right beside our, our school as well. So after school with mom and dad working, you went over and you met Grandpa at the curling club, and he put you to work moving tables and setting up chairs. And, you know, 11, 12 years old, it didn't seem right, but it's what you did because he... Coconut and chocolate bar was a reward. <laughs> <laughs> and did he let you throw the odd rock? Twelve? No, not till twelve years old. Really, he did. Oh, no. I, I was sure you'd break that rule too. You would think, no. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, Fred, with with my dad being in policing and FBI, yeah, I, yeah. I lived a very regimented childhood, <laughs> and you did not deviate too far from the line. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, you mentioned that you went to a championship in Switzerland, was that kind of the, when you had to make the choice between 21 stinky guys <laughs> in Sudbury or 14 age girls in Switzerland, was that the point at which curling became important? That was the very, that was the exact point curling yeah. became the, the primary sport in my life. Yeah, yeah. Now, I know we're gonna talk about the kids later, but I think it's fun to reflect on what Emily is doing now in terms of Switzerland and that trip. Yeah, so Emily now, she leaves the 22nd of February she has just won that same event that I won in 1985 that my buddy Glenn Howard won in 1981, the very first year the event even existed, to know that that event is still going on today and that our children are competing in it, that Glenn's children competed in it. It's, it's fantastic to know that. So she's going to go to Switzerland? Yeah. Yeah. With four teenage boys? With four teenage boys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Great. Well, one of them is her roommate at school. So. Yeah. <laughs> and they have chaperones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Glad, glad you're on top yeah. of that, Mom. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, now, Sherry, you grew up in Saskatchewan. You did your university in, mm -hmm. in Saskatchewan. When did you come to Ontario and why? I, I still don't know why. <laughs> oh, no, you. Yeah, that's right. Yes, I came for you. Uh, about 25 years ago, I uh, moved. Yeah, made the trek and drove from Saskatoon to Midland uh, three times by uh, myself. Wow. Yes, and my little Miata. Good for you. <laughs> and what brought you to Midland? Well, again, Sherry and I met 
and as as the story goes, we uh, we agreed we you know we wanted to live somewhere. And Cherry, obviously, small town girl, didn't want to be anywhere near Toronto. <laughs> so we made an agreement that we'll both start driving, and when we pass three million people, that's where we'll live. <laughs> it took me about an hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> it took me about here, thirty-two hours. Yeah, here we are <laughs> yeah. at Victoria Harbor. This yeah. this may be twenty-six years since we've uh, that's lived up great. Now. That's great. Well, let's talk about some of your many, many successes. And uh, Sherry, you uh, had your first, I, th I think your first major success in 1986. And I think I have a picture here. You tell oh, me. Oh, goodness. The hairstyle is going to be terrible. <laughs> oh, that was actually high school. That's so a that high was school before, picture. but that's lovely. Oh, OK. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was a, a provincial mixed. Uh, my team competed in that. And I was grade 10 there. And uh, yeah, first, you know, going to another town and competing as a, as a team, it was a great experience. Very social, curling is. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. Now, in your first year of university, mm -hmm. you were on a team that had some success. We did. We won the province and went to Canadians. So that was the junior yes. championship? Yeah. And were you skipping that team? I actually was uh, calling the game but throwing third stones. Yeah, which is a little unusual, but it worked yeah. w worked for our young team. And why yeah. why did you do that? Oh, we just figured it was um, less stress. Um, I had a teammate that loved throwing that that pressure stones, and I and I love the strategy part of the game, so it just worked for us. But you don't see it very often. And when you would win the provincials in Saskatchewan, you would go on to some national. Yeah, we did it at the juniors. We went to uh, Rouen, uh, Naranda, Quebec. Right. Which was uh, pretty amazing coming, you know, small town Saskatchewan going to northern Quebec. And how did you get there? Uh, by jet. And that was my, and this is first year university, that was my first time on a large airplane. Wow. Yes. I mean, and not saying that I wasn't, uh, I didn't travel, but my dad was a pilot, so he, we traveled in a, like a Cessna. Yes. So a four-seater yeah. plane. So I had been in a small plane all my life, but that was the first time I was on a jet. Yeah, that's Very nerve-wracking. And how did you do at the Nationals? Uh, we finished fourth, yeah, that's which great. was okay. Um, that was my first big experience with yeah. competing and traveling. And, and you have been in the Scotties mm -hmm. often. So first <laughs> of all, for both people in the audience who aren't curlers, Tell us what the Scotties is. Well, the Scotties is also known as the Scott Tournament of Hearts, which is the Canadian, the World Canadian uh, Championship, or sorry, the Women's Canadian Championship. So the Scotties is the Scott Tournament of Hearts, which is, which is going on uh, next week, actually starting Friday. And how many times have you competed in that? Uh, I believe seven. Okay. Once for Saskatchewan and then for Ontario. Now, I think we have a picture Six. here of the Saskatchewan yeah. one. Oh, yes. That's a <laughs> Now, there's a hairstyle. hairstyle. <laughs> yeah, I know. Crazy. Yeah, that's right. And the outfits. Ooh. Uh, the uniforms have changed quite a bit. Thank goodness. All of those <laughs> hairstyles are oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> A lot of hairspray. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> you actually, you could have played the lead, lead in Greece. <laughs> yes, could have. Right? <laughs> could have. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. quite a fro. <laughs> so how did how did that team make out? That team did quite well, considering that we weren't very experienced. We were playing against Colleen Jones, Colleen Laliberti. We finished fourth. Um, we were just ecstatic to make the playoffs. We definitely were a little out of our element, but yeah. So we that's had a the, lot of fun. That was in Thunder Bay. And that's in 96. Yes. Yeah. And then the next time you compete, it's for Ontario. Correct. After I had moved. And yes. you do that. I've got here 99, 2001, 2002, 2004, 2008, 2011. <laughs> and we have a couple of pictures of those teams. So I think. See, the hair is getting better. Yeah, yeah. That's a good yeah. haircut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that would be around 2001 or two? I, I believe so. Yeah. Again, uniforms aren't great. They get much better, but. Yeah. <laughs> and and how did the, those teams do in the early 2000s? Do you remember? We did a little bit better. Um, we finished, I was a four-time bronze medalist at the Scotties. Oh, good. Yes. Wow. Yeah, so, um, and I, a fun fact, um, when you go to the Scotties, because uh, it's a women's event, they, they hand out jewelry. Oh. So when you win your province, you receive a pendant Yes. Um, in the shape of the Scotty's logo, which is four hearts. Um, and then when you win your province again, you fill it in with diamonds. 
Wow. And when you fill in your pendant, um, then they give you a bracelet with diamonds. Ah. And then when you do well at Canadians, they give you a ring. And uh, being a four-time bronze medalist, I have emerald ring. Wow. Yes. Wow. Yes, jewelry. That saves a lot on jewelry work. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to continue with the story, it doesn't save you a lot on <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's skip to 2008. I, I know this isn't entirely chronological, yeah. but this would be uh, towards the end of, of, of your uh, Scotty's time. Yes. Were you skipping? Yes, uh, yeah. All of these rinks? Uh, pretty much except for 1999 when I first okay. moved to Ontario, but yes, the skip. Okay. Because um, I'm not a very good sweeper, um, oh. so that's why I skip. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I suspect your teammates would say there are other reasons why you were skipping, but yes, uh, maybe. you're being modest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You also uh, tried out for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. How many times did that take place? Um, I believe four times going to the trials. We also went to the pre-trials a couple times. So, and you think that the Olympics are every four years, so do the math. Yeah. Um, pretty old. <laughs> yeah, been around a long time. That's a big deal, isn't it? It's huge. Yeah. yeah. Um, so your first trial was what year? 90? Would have been 1997. For the 98 Olympics. Yeah. OK. And uh, in 2013, which would have been for the 2014 Olympics, you came very close. We did one game away from going to the Olympics. Yeah, wow. representing Canada. Wow, that's <laughs> mm -hmm. exciting. And uh, this is the rink. Yeah, yeah. Uniforms are getting better, aren't they? And so is the hair, yeah. So is the hair, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I hate to ask, but who did you lose to? <laughs> we lost to Jennifer Jones. <laughs> But she went on to win the gold medal. Okay, so, so you're the second best team So, you know, it doesn't quite hurt as much, but yeah. yes, yeah. Yeah, I think you should say you were the second best team in the world. Yeah. The only it, team that beat you were the best. Yes, yeah. very true, yeah. Good for you, good for you. Now, um, I, I have a picture here of the championship form. <laughs> and I don't know what year that's from, but... but One of the Scotties, yeah. That is yeah. concentration. Isn't it? Yes. Wow. Notice that the mouth is not fully open, though, shouting. No, yeah, which it no. usually is. But it, but it looks like you're trying to talk to the rock with your eyes. Probably, yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> now, in 2004, you won your first Canada Cup. Mm -hmm. What's the process for getting into the Canada Cup competition? Well, the Canada Cup was uh, an event put on by the Curling Curling Canada, which was uh, it, a huge event, and it uh, earmarked that. The winners of that would go into the Olympic trials, and um, it basically showed, showcased the, the top teams in the country. You know, you got to win a little bit of money. It just, like I said, you had to qualify that. It just showed that a team was very competitive and did well on the circuit. Good. So it was a big deal back then. That was the first one, and, and then that also quali and qualified you, us and for you the won Olympic trials. We yeah. did, yeah. Great. Now, you also competed in the TSN Skins Championship. Mm -hmm. Uh, how many times do you remember? Uh, I do believe we won it three times, twice maybe, and competed three or four times, and that was a big deal too because you're you're paying for a bit of money. You're playing for a bit of money, and curlers weren't making a lot of money, so that was a big deal to play for. And a what, bit of cash. what that, that that's kind of a big deal. Too, it is, yeah, it? and and getting on national TV as well. So lights and cameras and reporters yeah, and, and interviews. Know, exactly. Yeah, it was a yeah. lot of fun too. Very social again, but you're playing for, for money, which is always nice. And and how many teams qualify for that? Just four. Yeah, still all Canadian teams on the women's circuit. But yeah, so it was again a big deal but because so it was just it showed... Was it an invitational or do you work uh, to win your way onto you, that? You kind of still had to have um, like a good resume. Still right. had competed well, but it was in by invite. And what position did you uh, play your yeah. skip uh, when you won the championship? Correct, yep. yeah. Uh, may I ask you what the biggest prize <laughs> pot would be that you would have won? Uh, the one year we pulled in a check of $58,000, yeah, wow. which was big on the, the ladies' circuit yeah. back then. And I think my last shot in the final, which was a, a raise intern takeout, I think that was for about $26,000, $28,000, that <laughs> one shot. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of pressure. So, so at this point, you're winning money curling. Mm -hmm. And I think we should show our audience this cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> Can everybody read that? 
<laughs> Sherry is on your left of that. <laughs> and she's saying, Wayne, here's a little spending money until you and the Howard team win some of your own. <laughs> what do you think, Wayne? You know, as long as she gives me half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the deal. But two weeks later, you did win the skin, uh, yes. the skins game. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you you competed in an international event, and I'm interested in this because curling really is becoming a very international sport, and most of the script here is in an Asian script, not, it is, not yeah. in something that... That we, was in China. Was it in China? Yeah. yeah. And, and is your team uh, uh, on the upper part of the we podium We are. There? The best place to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Highest po point of the podium. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So congratulations yeah, on we, that. We, uh, we won that event and we beat the hometown um, team in the final. Oh, that would be exciting. Yes. Yeah. But it's, it's quite funny, again, and curling is such a small community, is um, the team on the third place podium in the yellow jerseys are from Sweden. Oh. Yes. And uh, two of those girls, uh, Wayne coached later on. Interesting. Yeah. Small world. It is. Yeah. Very small world. Yeah. Now, more recently, you got into the Ontario Senior League, um, which, looking at you, has to be over 35, right? <laughs> You're such a gentleman. <laughs> How many times have you competed in the Ontario Senior Championship? Uh, four times. Uh, we've won the event. We've won the Provincial Ontario Championship three times, going to Canadians. So you lied about your age. <laughs> did it, yeah, as known as a junior senior. <laughs> yeah. And and what's what's that competition like? Are, are, do people come from each province uh, yeah, the same each way Yeah, each province and each territory. And, and it's basically um, those that I grew up curling competitive against. So it's still quite competitive, still yes. very social, but yeah. it's, it's still good curling. Yeah. And, and you go to the Worlds, which is amazing. When you win the exciting. Canadians, you go to the Worlds. And how did you do in that? <laughs> Again, we keep runner-up. Um, but we lose to the best. So my first year in Canadian Seniors, we lost the final to Sherry Anderson, who has won the Worlds five times. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, you lose to good curlers. We do, we do. Lose. We just yeah. got to get over that hump. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Well, Wayne, let's talk about your uh, successes. And uh, first of all, I was fascinated to read that you are the only curler in the history of the sport to win the Briar and the World Championships three times at three different positions. So it, it break that down for us. What's that mean? It just means I'm smart enough to surround myself with really good teammates, <laughs> <laughs> is what that means. I've been very fortunate to curl with unbelievable talented people. Obviously, the top of the list are Russ and Glenn Howard. Um, Ian Tetley, obviously, a lot of people know as a three-time world championship himself with, you know, Ian's played with uh, Ed, Al Hackner and Ed Wernick. Like, yeah. These are the guys that have played with the best players in the world. And then after that, Brent Lang, who's, you know, been to the Olympics, yeah. curling with Kevin Cooey and everything else. So again surrounded myself with the best players in the world. Now, when you were playing three different positions, were you playing on the same team and just moving to a different position? No, or three different, different teams. Three different teams. Totally, yeah. Okay. The only common denominator is Glenn and myself. Okay. So, so Glenn Howard and I were on two of those. Well, this is the 1993 team, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> now, Larry Merkley there, too. Yeah, Larry Merkley's Mer there. I was teasing that this picture looks like it was taken before there were cameras. <laughs> 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 but Sherry explained to me that it's a picture of a, a picture, picture of a picture of a picture, yeah. a picture yeah. kind yeah. of thing. From yeah. a photo album. So who's in the picture, left to right? So Larry Merkley, uh, Peter Corner, myself, and then, of course, Glenn Howard and Russ Howard. Okay. That's right to left for those yeah. of you who... And, and, and I didn't see these pictures before Sherry sent them to you, so this yeah. is fine. Yeah, you did well. You <laughs> did well. Okay. So that was 93, and you were the second yes. on Team, Team Russ Howard. Howard. Yes. Then in 98, you again won Provincials, Briar, World Championship, and you were the third... Skip. Oh, you were the, the skip, skip on, on 
Glenn Hurd? No, that was 98. Totally different. Oh, okay. Totally oh, no, different no. This is Team Madaw in 98. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you're Skip. And then in 2012, yes. you are third on Team, uh, team Glenn Hurd. Yes. So three different teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good for you. Are you still friends with these people that you... <laughs> I like to believe with, with those guys, as well as anyone else I'd, I'd ever played with in my time at men's, I could pretty much call them up and say, hey, do you want to play, uh, want a game of golf, or you want to go for a beer? Yeah. And they would. We're all still best friends to this That's day. And, uh, and some of them we've had, you know, we've had tough times. You've had highs and lows with, but uh, yeah. still very good friends. And that's one of the things I take That's a lot good. of pride in, in uh, building relationships again at a young yeah. age. Good for you. You were a seven-time McCain TSN Skins champion. Now, we heard that Team Mada Female won $58,000. <laughs> Did you top that? We had one very good event up in Whitehorse, where uh, similar to Sherry, actually, we had a bunch of carryovers playing. Kevin Martin, who, in my mind, yeah. is probably one of the best players ever to play. Right. But I literally had to draw the eight foot for $88,000. Wow. And all as I could think of the whole time going down in the hack is, oh my God, if I miss this, I'm gonna, my, my buddies that I'm current with are gonna kill me because it's 22 grand out of each one of their pockets yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, thank God, made the draw. And it's funny, after I talked to them, after Fred, as, as the sweepers, I talked to them, they said, we've never swept so far in front of a rock. Normally you <laughs> sweep right in close. They said, we were not gonna burn it, we were way in front. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny, that's funny. So that, that again, we, we talked about the big lights and the, you know, the television. That, that, those events would have been televised. Yeah, the Skins game was my first exposure to uh, the television lights, the crowd right there. Uh, all the press, all the media, everything else. And, and I was very fortunate that my first four Skins games were with, with Russ and Glenn. Yeah. And Russ knew everything, knew all the ins and outs and what to do. And, and we're playing Ed Wernick in the final. Probably one of the very few times in my life I was nervous. This is back in 91, but yeah. as a young kid, pretty wet behind the ears yeah. and, uh, and just trying to take it all in and learn. Yeah, exciting. Yeah. Now, that Skins game was played at Casino Rama yeah. in Aurelia. And I remember being in the big theater there, and they said they were going to set it up for curling sort of in front of the stage. What's that like to be Th That was actually fantastic. Really? I played in a few of those, yeah. I was very lucky to, to somehow work my way into that event, and uh, it was truly a riot. There was about 5,500 people in the entertainment center with one sheet of curling ice and uh, all the TV lights and everything else going on. Uh, wow. The ice wasn't the best, so you had to adapt a little bit. Cause yeah. The first couple of years, it was a, a learning curve, but it, it was truly a treat to play in an environment like that. Yeah. Well, that's part of curling, isn't it? Adapting to the ice? It sure is, it yeah. and it changes every, every end. Yeah. I'm just sort of picturing you know, all those people watching one, uh, one sheet of ice. That's, yeah. It's kind of like the big tennis matches where there's these huge stadiums and just one little court. Yeah, and I was also, when you think of the big fans, so I was lucky enough to play in the one briar that had the largest attended briar in the history of briars, and that was uh, in Edmonton back when Randy Furby was on a roll, and every game was 17,000 people. Wow. Like a sold, out, wow. sold out NHL arena watching four sheets yeah. of curling, and, and it, was, it, it was a bit nerve wracking until you got into it, but you would miss a shot and and because we were one of the high-end teams, you'd miss a shot and you'd literally have 12,000 people go, boo. <laughs> <laughs> and you felt it, you'd be like, oh. you just put your head down like, oh. <laughs> but it was, it was a high and low, but it was, it was something else to look around and see that many people interested in curling. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. How many times were you a provincial champion? Uh, 10. Okay, <laughs> good. Now, uh, we should, since we've shown Sherry's form, this is, this is your form. <laughs> Pretty good. That's post-broken yeah. leg, too. <laughs> is it? Yeah. <laughs> wow. The concentration. <laughs> Look at those eyes. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. Um, the briar. First of all, explain to our audience what the briar is. So the briar is the Canadian curling championship for men. Mm -hmm. And how many times you played in that? That's 10. Okay. That was, uh, because you had to be a provincial yeah. champion to play in it. Actually, so, the one time I guess yeah. I wasn't a provincial champion, uh, um, you might know the story a little bit for our buddy, again, Glenn Howard, uh, had a bit of a snowmobile accident. 
So I might have been there as the fifth, but then all of a sudden I got thrust into the spotlight and got to take over his position somehow. Which oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, how many times have you... They, it, one of the things that's interesting to me about the Briars, and maybe they do it in many other tournaments, is that there are all stars at each position, like mm -hmm. the, the best lead and second. And how many times were you an all-star? I was lucky enough to be selected seven times. Seven yeah. times. Yeah. And who makes the decision and how? Well, it's done, basically, there's, there's two ways, there's two criteria you have to meet in, and all week long they keep stats of every player, of every game, of every shot, and then, so you have to be at the top of the stats category, and there's normally a few guys that are up there, and then it is voted on by the, the reporters who are there all week for the guys who seem to, you know, contribute, as, contribute to the team and just are their good teammates. And like I said, I surrounded myself with good teammates, so I, they made me look good. <laughs> They might say the same about you, Wayne. Maybe. <laughs> no. So I see, I, uh, watching curling, I'll see somebody is, is curling 93% or 88% or something like that. Is that weighted for the complexity of the shot? Yes. Yeah, it is. It okay. Is. So, so, yeah. so if, you, if you do a simple, whatever a simple shot is, uh, you might not get as highly rated for that as if you do something very complex. It's, it's a little bit, so every shot is, is raced on, based on four points for each shot. Okay. So if you have a wide open takeout and you make the hit and stay the takeout, you would get four out of four, the same as if you made a double. But if you had to make a raise takeout or a draw through the port to a really small area, you could actually get five out of four. I see. You okay. can get bonus points okay. for really good ones. Now there's also a world curling Tour Players Championship, mm -hmm. which is unrelated to any of the other stuff we've talked about so far. Yes. And how do you, who gets to play in that and how and why? Well, it's, it's, it's the year-end culmination of all the events you play in all year. So the World Curling Tour now, in today's world, runs August to May. Back when, back when we were playing with Russ and Glenn, it would run probably more like October to uh, maybe late March. Yeah. And... Uh, you had to win a bunch of events or do really well to qualify for the Players' Championship. And then so only 12 teams would qualify, and then you'd play off. It, it was almost like another world championship. And there are uh, all of these events, but there are certain events in there that are major events. What, what are they called? Grand Slams. Grand Slams. So now you see them on TV, on Sportsnet, and very similar to the, the World Curling Tour is a mirror image of golf. Okay. And so you have events every weekend, but there's four majors throughout the year on the tour. So how many teams start out in August? How many teams would, would well, it, begin in the process? So on the World Curling Tour worldwide, you'd be over 1,000 teams, 1,200, 1,300 okay. teams worldwide right. that would enter all the cash spiels all over the place. Okay. And then, but, but in these Grand Slam events, only, like even a normal cash spiel might be 32 teams. Right. And then of those, a couple of those teams might be Grand Slam teams. And then how many compete for the championship at the end? How many teams? Normally 12. 12 teams, yeah. okay. Okay, and how many countries would be represented? Well, curling is now played in 75 countries, I think, yeah. worldwide. It's, yeah. it's crazy how much it's grown. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and when you think of it, Canada is actually becoming smaller, as we see with their medal results, a little bit. But Japan has really taken off. Hmm, interesting. Um, you were on the 2010, I'm sorry, before that, we talked about Olympic trials with Sherry. How many times did you compete in the Olympic trials? Four, I think, as well. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's it, only every four years, so. Yeah. <laughs> You're old, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, how many times did you go on to play at the Olympic level? Never. Never, never once. I was okay. never even as close as Sherry, so I had to uh, jump on some coattails to be a coach. Okay, <laughs> we'll talk about that. Um, you won the 2010 Canada Cup Championship with Team Howard, mm -hmm. and there's something called the Continental Cup Champion that I read about. Um, and that, that strikes me as interesting because it, it, it's, it's sort of an... an a minor international thing. Tell me what that's all about. It is, it is the Ryder Cup of curling for the okay. golfers. Uh, it is basically six North American teams, three men, three ladies, versus three world teams, or three men, three ladies, world teams. So they can come from anywhere around the world. 
They're basically the top ranked teams in the world that are not North American. Okay. And you play, you know, you play like match play. There's different formats. There's mixed doubles. There's there's skins. There's everything else. So it's it's different formats. It's it's a made for TV event for curling. Okay. And it's a ton of fun to play in. Now I want to ask you both a number of questions about curling, just to drill down a little bit. Now that now that we've qualified you as experts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's the lawyer Ooh, in you coming yeah, in, eh? yeah. <laughs> Did we sign a waiver? Yeah. Hmm. Um, how, did he, how did curling get started? Where, where, where and when? Do you know what the background is to the sport? I actually do. She's the educated one. Yeah. <laughs> it started in Scotland. Scotland? Yeah. Yeah, in the, around the mid-16th century. Mm -hmm. Played on ponds, like outdoors. And what did they use for curling stones? They probably would have used frozen jam cans, what maybe frozen yeah. stones. Well, actually the granite, because the granite comes from Scotland. Um, so it would have been probably very similar to what you see nowadays. Um, maybe just a little bit larger. I think they had to bring their own stones to the game. Everyone, right? Back I read day. somewhere yeah, that, they the used, that, 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 that they'd use flat bottom river rocks, that the, oh, okay. that the rocks would be... Uh, don't 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 quote me on well, that. But. Google's a wonderful thing. We probably should have used that before we came here tonight. Sorry, we Google. should have used Google. Yes. To get this out <laughs> well, we we'll came. do that now yeah. and see whether we're anywhere near exactly. being right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll ask each of this question. What attracted you to curling? Um, I know for me, again, that was the thing to do. My mother and my grandmother both curled, so it was just a natural progression to go to the, the rink. I went and watched them, so just when we were able to step on the ice and play, and um, it was great because it was very social, and it mm -hmm. seemed like in my small town, Rose Town, everyone curled, so it was just natural to go there and, again, waste away the winter months. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was family. Same thing, my mom and dad family. did play, yep. my grandfather did play, not at a high-end competitive level, but they were always at the curling club, I have the feeling it was more because of there was a really good bar in the curling club, <laughs> which, which is something they probably passed down. But uh, <laughs> it was just a family thing, and it was just another sport that got put in front of us. And it turned out that I, I ended up having a couple friends that did it. And then I ended up having some, some very fortunate experiences through curling. Yeah. Um, part of how I ended up up here in Midland was curling for high school at a young age and getting billeted by Russ Howard. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, isn't that neat? <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> Interesting. In your early days, and, and, and later perhaps, what role does nerves play in the sport? Well, like anything, and even in life, is just it, it's, you put yourself in that moment, and it can be very stressful, and you either, the nerves can overcome you, or you can get the better of the nerves. So it is like, like anything, like if you're speaking in front of people, or, or playing different sports, or, or doing anything, it's just, it can, it can, if you put yourself in a stressful situation, there are going to be nerves. Yeah. Sometimes good nerves, sometimes bad nerves. Yeah, and I, and I loved it. I felt I was the best version of myself when I was in that situation. Interesting. I felt I was a, a better teammate. I could, I actually got calmer, and it just seemed like where I belonged. Yeah, and, uh, interesting. It, it, it never bothered me. It was more nerves up here, sitting here talking to you, Fred, than there, than there is throwing a draw for 80 grand. <laughs> well, and it's bringing out the best in you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> He's good. Different. Yeah. What physical attributes are needed to be a curler? Well, you see it nowadays. Um, you have to be very athletic. Uh, yeah. When you look at the, the number of games that you play at the high level, the sweeping, um, and the more athletic you are, the better you're going to do. Um, you won't uh, face the injuries that you would if you weren't in shape. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll see when you watch it on any stage, like the Scotties, the Briar, or the Worlds, how athletic they are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree with Sherry. I, I actually worked hard on my legs to make sure my legs were always in good shape. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, the sweeping is such a mm -hmm. big part of it. And again, back to playing the years with Russ and Glenn Howard, a lot of times we'd make the playoffs, you'd play three 10 end games in a row, back nine, 12, and three. Yeah. Back to back, so you had to be in half decent, much better shape than we are in now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I am, anyways. Yeah. I'm not sharing. Well, I'll, I'll I'll share with you. This is going to be true confession time. That that there's something you don't want to be to curl. I when I moved to Midland tried curling, and I got on a team with a couple of guys who would have been have been at least 50 years older than me. <laughs> Some of the people here will remember Reg Mulligan and Johnny Bridges, and after. Uh, one night of curling, they suggested that 
they didn't think it was a sport made for a six foot six body. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they were right. Uh, <laughs> what uh, mental, emotional attributes are needed to succeed? I, I think just, um, you know, you want to be um, excited and you want to be up for the games, but you also have to have that um, calmness about you. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see different emotions, say from a friend and player, that they're really up, they're, they're sweeping and, and they're full of energy, where you have the skip position has to be very calm, mm -hmm. has to be very collected. So you see a variety of emotions and just, you know, anyone that watches it on TV too, you'll see certain players that don't even crack a smile and others that are just, you know, feel that they've had so much um, Red Bull in their system, right? Like, yeah. so you see a little bit of everything, similar to golf, right? Like there's certain players that are very even keeled and others that are just so much energy. Yeah, yeah and I, I think it's, uh, curling is, to me, it's, it's, it's very similar to life and is you have to build relationships with your teammates and in the same way you do in business and the same way you do with anything else and there has to be a trust there. And then everything you do, whether, you know, you're trying to compete, it's, Again, whether you're in business or whether you're in anything else, you're trying to compete to be better or to make that extra sale or go that extra step farther than the next person. And you're, to me, you're always trying to win. And yeah. it's, it's just, yeah. again, the way I was brought up in a competitive nature. Tell me, Sherry, about the evolution of the equipment in the sport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's changed a lot. It really has. And like, like golf or anything else, and for the better. Um, you've got the shoes out there, you've got the, the brooms and, and everything else, and it, it really has evolved. Um, it's streamlined a bit. Um, I, for anyone that follows curling, there was the broom gate a couple of years ago where um, different manufacturers made different brooms and found out through studying it that some were better than others. Uh, and now it's more of an equal field that the fabric's all the same, still different manufacturers and maybe styles of broom, but the fabric that we're using is all the same. Mm -hmm. um, you can still, I mean, so the, the equipment's the same, but you still have those physical bodies where you're gonna have sweepers that are better than others because of their physical attributes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, certainly the equipment has come a long ways. Yeah. Okay, we talked a, a little bit about sort of how international the sport has become. What's happening to the numbers in Canada? Is, is curling growing or is it plateauing or is it declining? I'm going to say it's plateauing a little bit in Canada. North America it's growing. In the U.S. it's actually very much taken off with their Has recent it? success in the Olympics. They're mm -hmm. building clubs all over the U.S. Mm -hmm. where Canada, especially the GTA, which close to us has, has really started to drop off a little bit. I think it's, there's too many other things to do, mm -hmm. but you still get outside Toronto and in it's one of the greatest things that everyone can do at every level. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly growing internationally, which is great for the sport. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier Japan. How long has the sport been big in Japan? Uh, probably about 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. um, I was there in the late 80s teaching, uh, teaching curling, and, uh, and it's, that was very new back then, but it has just taken off. Hmm. Well, in Japan hosted the 98 um, Olympics. And that usually grows the sport okay. in that country. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that uh, curling was uh, first um, medal, uh, yeah. right? An yeah. official medal sport? Yes, 98. Yeah, 98. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you both talked a little bit about sort of the importance of the team. You've talked about team chemistry. You've talked about relationships. Tell us a bit about the makeup of a team. What, how, how do you go about putting a team together, Sherry? Well, you look at, first of all, um, I know it's very important, I think, for females is, is your team dynamics, kind of who you can get along with. So you certainly look at skill, um, and each position requires its own skill base. So you look at that, but you definitely think of, you're spending a lot of time with these three other individuals. So who gets along, who brings out the best in each other? Um, definitely a lot of trust, respect, communication skills. So I think it's very important that you still get a well-skilled team but it's building those team dynamics. Mm -hmm. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Me too. So you, can, you can always train and get better skill-wise, but it's very hard to change someone's attitude. And does the team train together? Um, I think back in the day when you had four individuals from the same community, but now your team is it's more spread out, so it's probably a lot more meeting up at competitions and training individually rather than training as a, an entire unit. 
I was surprised to learn chatting with you that the people who represent Nova Scotia don't all have to live in Nova <laughs> Scotia. No, you're right. Now, now with the rule, you can have an import or you can have, if you were born in Nova Scotia, even if you live in Alberta, you can go back and play out of Nova Scotia. Yeah. So it's, it's very different nowadays. So if you move a lot, you can play for any team you want. Pretty much, <laughs> yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not a great thing, but the rule's been put in place to compete internationally. Hi. Because you play against Scotland, they can draw their team from anywhere in Scotland, where Canada can only draw their teams provincially. Right, So that's, right. Okay. that's why the rule's yeah. in there. Yeah. We see players come and go from teams. You'll see a group curl together at a very high professional level and then suddenly somebody's missing. Are there hard feelings? Sometimes, for sure. Um, I think egos. There's been a few yeah. over the years that are really hard feelings. Um, but uh, other times there's just people at different stages in their life. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody's having a baby. Somebody has a job that doesn't give them the time off they need. Um, th yeah. There's a million different reasons why it could change, but yes, if it's just a straight out curling change, there are hard feelings. Yeah. But I think if, if you would establish a team because of good team dynamics, and if there are changes on the team and it's done with respect and communication, then you're still going to have that friendship. It may, you know, your ego gets bruised and maybe not like the day after you cut someone, but eventually it comes back. And, and I would say for the most part, like our, our teams and all the teams we've been through, it's a lot of friendship. Yes. Yeah. Is there a difference between the level of competition at the club and at the <laughs> provincial or national level? I don't know. Is there? there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The same, yeah. Same. <laughs> From what I saw last night in our major league, it's, oh, high level. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, you know what, it, the great way to compare it is, is curling is a great sport is that anyone can be great any day. So you can go out and you can make a double takeout or you can get a five ender on somebody or you can draw the button. Whereas, I don't know what your football town is, but you can't go out on the Super Bowl field and throw a, throw a pass. Yeah. You can't throw a 90 mile an hour pitch. You're not gonna play hockey in an NHL arena. Right. But you can throw a curling rock and you can make a draw to the button. Yeah. So that's why curling appeals to everybody and appeals to the club level. It, it appeals to the great players too. Same, the exact same way golf does. Everybody can hit a great drive and make a long putt for birdie yeah. on the same golf course that Tiger Woods does it on. Yeah but not everybody, like I but say. But not can, 70 times. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. That's, the, that's the gist of it. But as yeah. soon as you do it once, yeah. you think you can do it 70 yeah. times. <laughs> and that's what brings us I back. saw Glenn Howard make that hit and roll. Why, yeah. can, you know, why can I do it every time exactly. like Glenn Howard does? Do some teams stack their teams? Now, before you answer that question. Ah, I know where you're going. Where I understand going? that there is a Tuesday night competition. And it's called the Major League at the Penetanguishing Curling Club. <laughs> And I understand that this team oh. was entered one Tuesday night. I just, <laughs> I just wonder if you'd tell us who's in that picture, just from left to right, and maybe what their qualification was to get on a club team. <laughs> I think I recognize world champion Glenn Howard. Yeah. yeah. I certainly recognize the two of you. Correct. Uh, I, I guess the ringer is the dark-haired lady. Has she ever she? curled before? Yeah, the only, uh, the only Olympic medals in that picture are from that spare we brought in that week. <laughs> yeah. 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 She has Olympic gold and Olympic bronze, and yeah, yeah. She's a pretty good spare we brought in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's Anna Hasselberg. From Anna Sweden. Hasselberg. Yes. Yeah, Team yeah. Hasselberg. Well, she stayed cool. at our house that night, so we said, oh, of then course. you need to come yeah. curl. Yeah. 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 Did everybody from the Penetang Club think that was fair? <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> no, apparently not. <laughs> Actually, we, we, we better move on. <laughs> there may be a brawl. <laughs> um, we talked about relationship with your teammates. At this highly competitive level, what's the relationship like with competitors, with the other teams? <laughs> You play head games, Wayne? Oh, I love it. That's one of my <laughs> favorite parts. <laughs> again, like, super competitive comes out. And, and again, I, I lived a regimented life, so I, I stick to the rules. But I'm not afraid to tell you, Fred, you know what? I don't think you're as good as I am. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of chirping? Yeah, I'm not, a, not afraid to do that. But I, it's fun. And, and it's, yeah. there's other guys out there, like Craig Savile, who I curl with, is one of the best at it as well. And uh, Ben Hebert who you'll see all the time. He's been to the Olympics a few times. There's some great players out there. And the guys who do it get to know the other guys who yeah, do it. Yeah. So it really becomes entertaining on the ice. It's, you'll see them more than once reach up and 
put their hand over their microphone and yeah. mm -hmm. chirp the other guy. <laughs> but, but even at the high level, there's still some, maybe not on the ice, but, but after the game, you know, there's still the social aspect. Sure. Um, maybe more back in the day that you see. You don't see it now. You don't see it you now. You don't see it now. No. You, go to, you don't go to Briar. The teams would never sit down and have a drink with each other. Uh, luckily, my first Briar 91, they did still, yeah. but now not a chance. Yeah. Most, of them, most of them don't even drink. Yeah. They're pretty, yeah. they're athletes, they're heading to the gym. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. Yeah. You know, I, 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 running through my mind is, is sort of some of the, the great um, chirping that I've heard in various sports. But, <laughs> and we're going to talk about golf in a minute. But I remember <laughs> playing golf with somebody who said to a guy who was on the tee, I want to congratulate you. You play really well for a guy with that swing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, can you, can you imagine what the guy's thinking? Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure you say that to your curling competitor, too. <laughs> Let's talk about coaching. This is the next, the next career, mm -hmm. right? So, Sherry, what are your qualifications to coach? Uh, good question. Oh, no, you, you have <laughs> Well, actually, in Canada, you do have to go through a qualification process by taking courses and um, becoming a level one, level two. So there, there are what we call like hoops that you have to jump through. Mm -hmm. um, certainly helps if you've played the sport at a high level because you can talk through experience. Mm -hmm. um, but I've taken numerous courses. I'm considered a level two coach, a competitive coach. I'm also a high performance consultant. Mm -hmm. And Wayne? Yeah, very similar. And simply uh, at the time when our daughters took it up, I wanted to be part of their curling career. So I said, I will do whatever it takes. So yeah. did these same courses that Sherry did at different times. Of course, we would never do it together. Yeah. At different times, uh, obtained my, uh, my high performance consultant status. And then uh, it, it got to be very entertaining after a while, just to be able to be part of that from behind the glass point of view. Yeah, interesting. Sherry, let's talk about some of the highlights. I know that uh, this is a highlight for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the cold water curling club with our two girls. Yeah. Uh, I think they're probably five and two at that time. Yeah. Oh. And you're now coaching them at what level? Well, um, when they were U18, U21, um, we figured, okay, we're watching behind the glass. We might as well coach and help out, yeah. as often you see of, of Coaching is usually a parental thing. So yeah, we've coached them at different levels, which is great to become involved. So it's a bit like hockey or baseball or anything else, the parent exactly. coach? Like, like yeah. any parent yeah. and, who's, you know, son plays baseball, lacrosse, yeah. hockey. It, it just, like Sherry said, it's, it's better sometimes to be right there on the bench than behind the glass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, you've coached a, a, a high performance team uh, Team Flurry? Yeah, I coached Team Flurry for a year and a half, um, two Scotties and at uh, Olympic trials, and uh, came so close. How close did you come? <laughs> One shot away from going to the Olympics. Yeah. And who grand. prevented you from going <sighs> to the Olympics? That darn Jennifer Jones again. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, why won't she retire? No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, yeah, it was, it was a pleasure to coach uh, that team. Like I said, we went to two Scotties and we went to the Olympic trials. And at that point before the final game, they were undefeated and playing absolutely amazing. And yeah, uh, we lost on last rock. Wow. And, uh, in an extra end. In an extra end. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, and again, fun fact, um, would have coached again against Wayne at the Olympics because he was there coaching oh, Team right. Sweden. So oh, would that would have been Team been. Canada against Team Sweden. Yeah, yeah that would have been fun. <laughs> <laughs> Probably fun for those watching. Yeah. <laughs> How did you get into co to coaching, and, and why women? Let's, <laughs> one at a time. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a, I'll try and shorten it up the best I can. Is, is I mentioned earlier, I broke my leg pretty bad, and uh, that ended my curling career. Or so I thought, and then uh, a couple of years of sitting around the house kicking things in the winter and not doing a whole lot. Uh, this ladies' team from Sweden actually reached out to Sherry ah. and said, how would you be if we approached your husband and asked him to coach our team and travel the world with five Swedish women? <laughs> <laughs> and Sherry went after a year and a half of being home with a broken leg. Yeah, take, take him. Take him away. <laughs> take him away. Just take him. <laughs> 
So everything happens for a reason. I would have never probably been in that role if, wow. uh, if I hadn't broke my leg. So as it turned out to be a blessing in disguise. And That's pretty classy that they would, that they would ask you yeah. how you felt about it before approaching Yeah, they're me. a great bunch of women. Yeah, great. Um, how many men are coaching women's teams? Uh, majority of the majority? ladies' teams, yeah. yeah. So last year at the Olympics, um, of the 10 ladies' teams at the Olympics, eight of the 10 coaches were Canadian, and I think six of the 10 were male. Wow, yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk about Team Sweden, mm -hmm. which is who you were coaching, uh, Anna Hasselberg, the woman who we saw in a picture there. Um, you started that in 20... 19? 19, yeah, 19? Four, four full years, four, a full Olympic cycle. Now, you can tell me you don't want to answer this, but uh, do you get paid for doing that? Is, is, yes, yeah. you, you do. You, yeah. you basically get your expenses covered and, uh, and you get a little bit of, of money, but uh, there's no retiring on a coaching, curling coaching salary, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if the team does better, do you do better? I did, yes. Yeah, yeah, it was good. nice that way, but it, yeah. th more importantly, it's... I got to be around as, as I got to know them, four fantastic women who literally were thirsty for knowledge of the game of curling. And uh, I was lucky I had a little bit I could pass along. That's great. Well, I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you could put up with being around <laughs> those women. I mean, good for you, Wayne. That's got to be a real yeah. burden to be Hard with them. Step. Hard to Beijing, take. Beijing, China, just after the medal presentation on the ice at the Olympics last year. That, was, uh, wow. that still gives me chills, that experience, to be there for part of that. Yeah. So um, this team won the European Curling Championship a couple of times. Mm -hmm. uh, they won seven Grand Slams. Mm -hmm. With me, yeah. They, uh, this was silver? Bronze. This was bronze. Yeah, those are the events, yeah, they won with me. Bronze, okay. And then you finished just out of the money in 21 and 22? At the World Championships, yeah. yeah. We, we had a second uh, runner-up silver medal. And I think uh, two fourths. Okay, okay. And um, I just want to also ask you about your daughter's curling at this point. I know we're kind of mixing <laughs> thoughts here, but um, one of your daughters curls with Team Harris. Is that? Oh, Mara Harris. So no. Uh, so <laughs> to help you out here, you were talking about the trip to Switzerland a few years yeah, ago. Yeah. Yeah. Our youngest daughter, who's heading over the end of February to Switzerland, she won it the very first time a couple years ago with Mara Harris. Okay. Mike Harris's daughter. Mike Harris's daughter. Mike yeah. Harris yeah. the curler. The not curler. The yeah. 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 We have to be very careful yeah. with yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Sherry, you coached your daughter's team. Mm hmm. Um, but. But you didn't get to do that because you were coaching the other <laughs> daughter. Is that yes. right? So the, the event that they were in to go to Switzerland, I actually were, was coaching uh, our other daughter, Kelly, at the U21 Provincial. So Wayne stepped in to oh, that event. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's great to keep <laughs> in the family. Yeah. <laughs> now, just a couple of questions. And, and, and uh, time is never our friend on this program. A couple of questions about coaching in general. Do you have to be a good curler to be a good curling coach? No, certainly not. No, I, I definitely think it helps. Then you can, um, your experience, because I think that's what the athletes are looking for, right, is um, not necessarily how to do things, but when we're in this situation, how should we handle it? So I think it's very important to have experienced those things, the highs and the lows. I think there's a, there's a, a bunch of different coaching opportunities. There's technical coaching, there's, there's mental coaching, there's off-ice coaching, there's, and then there's the big thing is the strategy side of the coaching. Yeah, okay. and, uh, and I think that's where, you know, where someone like myself or uh, Glenn Howard who coaches Jennifer Jones, Sherry's nemesis, yeah. can, uh, can bring so much to the table. Right. Yeah. Can really help that unless you have that experience in the situation because it's, it is truly curling strategy for anyone who has ever played is not textbook. Yeah. And what works in this situation might not work in tomorrow's situation when you're playing against a different team on different ice conditions right. and everything right. else. So the okay. only way to learn that is through experience, right? Okay. Now, we talked about your daughters, and we just have a couple of pictures of them here. <laughs> um, this picture is the four of you on skates mm -hmm. on the ice in front of your house. Yeah, in George Victoria Bay. Harbor. And in this picture, is a little older. <laughs> 
Is this, uh, is this in front of your home as well? Or? No, this is actually in Florida, <laughs> on vacation. Yeah, I yeah. didn't think there was a sand beach in front <laughs> yeah. of you. No, Victoria not in Bay. <laughs> yeah. Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Emily's going to Switzerland. She is, yeah. And uh, to represent Canada at a junior event. And, the, and, is, and she's also competing in the U21, is that? She is, yeah. So okay. uh, a week after they get back from Switzerland, she'll be at Provincials in Ottawa. In Ottawa, okay. Yeah. And Kelly, Kelly's doing something interesting. <laughs> Kelly, uh, she goes to school in Pembroke, which gives her the opportunity to curl out of Quebec, where she's joined a team in Quebec that have won the Provincial Championship. And hopefully we'll see her this Friday night on TV playing in the Scott Tournament of Hearts versus uh, Team Canada. Yeah. Wow, yeah. congratulations. Yeah. 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 That's exciting. That's, that's got to be very cool. It is. Yeah, we'll be in the stands cheering her on. Yeah, in Kamloops. Kamloops. Yes, yeah. where Wayne won the Worlds. In Same the, building. Yeah, same, same building. 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 Wow. Yeah. It's unbelievable what a small what community curling is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Okay, well, Wayne, I know you want to talk about golf. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you've been a golf professional since the mid-80s, 86? I played into the PGA of Canada in 1986. Okay. Um, you spent 11 years at St. George's, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful golf course. It is one of the, yeah, in Canada yeah. it is. I, I'm a terrible golfer, but I, I think golf, golf courses can be very beautiful places. Mm -hmm. A nice place to go for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you were here in Midland at the Midland Golf and Country Club. How long were you there? Uh, 11 years again. It's, you'll start okay. to see a trend. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's a little bit, all the stories again is all the years I curled with Russ and Glenn Howard, I didn't live here. And then once I stopped curling with them, I moved here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went to Port Carling. How long were you there? 11 years. <laughs> 33 years seemed like a long enough time to work in the golf industry. Yeah, wow. But I that's kept my PGA status, so I'm still a PGA member to this day. And are you? I yeah. play in a few senior PGA events. Actually, I just got home from one in Florida that was a lot of fun. And so it's well, you like won the Ontario Professional PGA event eight times? I won a few, yeah. Few yeah, ones. wow. But over 33 years, that's not very many. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you qualified for Team Ontario yeah. for the Ontario uh, Quebec Titleist yeah, Cup. Ryder Cup, yeah. You're a certified level three instructor. Mm -hmm. um, now, you're also a pretty good club fitter. Yeah. Club fitting now for anyone who golfs, it's, it's you, you almost have to buy custom fitted clubs and you are the prime example as you sit across from me, the same person that is 6'6 is not gonna use the same set of clubs that Sherry's gonna use. Yeah. So you have to go through custom fitting. So yeah, I took a bunch of courses and uh, one actually club for the year for all of Ontario. So when you're competing against the St. George's and the Nationals and the Bayviews and all the biggest clubs in, in Toronto, to win it for all of Ontario was, uh, was quite a treat uh, for, uh, for a little head pro up here at Midland Golf Course. <laughs> now you played some of the great golf courses in the world and, and I have to tell you, I love this picture. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody know where that is? <laughs> St. Andrews. Yeah. The Royal and Ancient, is that yeah. what they call it? That was November. Was it? Yeah. Wow. And, and what's that bridge called? It's famous. The Swilkin Bridge. Swilkin Bridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lots of history. Yeah. That's a great picture. Good for you. <laughs> now, this is a little different picture, Sherry. What's going on here? <laughs> we were on vacation. Yeah. Yeah. At the Snake Pit. That's, that's Innisbrook yeah. in uh, Florida. Florida. And they play a PGA Tour event there, and there's a there's a few holes that are very difficult, and it's very called difficult. the Snake Pit. Mm -hmm. I actually yeah. I actually looked it up. <laughs> I, there's one called the Moccasin, mm -hmm. and one called the Rattler, and one called the Copperhead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this guy is warning you what lies ahead. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. hit us that day. Yeah. Now, Sherry, let's talk about some other interests. Um, you have a business. I run. do. Tell us about that. Uh, I am the owner of 4M Home and Garden. I was a stay-at-home mom for 16 years, and I figured, you know what, I probably should get to work and earn my keep. <laughs> so, yes, start a business and do property management. And, and so people would hire you to look after their apartment building or look after their home maintenance? or uh, Right now it's, yeah, looking right. after cottage property and right. maintaining and landscaping. Great. 
Wayne, your official title is Private <laughs> Project Manager, which sounds very expensive. <laughs> it is very expensive, if you'd like to hire me. You, you work for a construction company. I do. What's it called? Urbicon Construction. And what kind of things do they do? Uh, they do big things they build. The biggest thing they built is Terminal 1. Wow. So that's kind of big. That's big. Yeah, and they build Microsoft data centers. Wow. So that's kind of big. But uh, one of the gentlemen of the company who's been a friend to the community here and is, uh, has given a ton of money to Georgian Bay General Hospital, he's, he has a place up here. At, but he has, uh, he has his own private projects. And sometimes they're construction. Right now, we're, uh, we're building a huge barn for him. But we're also uh, getting a farm-to-table operation off the ground. Oh, so good. Whatever his head wraps his mind around that we're going to do, uh, I become that guy. He's like, Wayne will do that. Yeah. <laughs> he has the ideas, and yep. you execute yep. them. It's like having your own guy. I'm that guy that just takes care of it. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. OK, we talked about your daughters. But I, I also want to talk about uh, some of the other special things in your life. Um, I think that view is one of them. <laughs> so this is the waterfront at your home? This it is. is. Your home's really important to you, isn't it? It is. Well, like, you know, especially after going through COVID and you spend a lot of time in your home and when you have a view like that and, you know, the sun sets and it just, you know, makes getting up a little bit easier each day. And we've had a few Docktails, I guess. <laughs> it was. It, it. It is very important to us still to this day. As, yeah. as a, as a guy who grew up in West End Toronto, Etobicoke, Brampton, his whole life, family cottage on Lake Simcoe with Western exposure, I always thought if I could ever get a job where I could live on the water year round, that yeah. would be the ultimate dream. Yes. And lo and behold, I applied for this job at Midland, and uh, a few gentlemen who are still a big part of the community today, hired me. Some saw something in me and hired me, and. Uh, and then that's when Sherry decided to move here. And I said, OK, we have to find a place with Western exposure yeah. Yeah. where we can have our boat at home. I said, I don't want to go to this. So there we are, Victoria Harbor, beautiful home of beautiful sunsets. Yeah, and the like best, best place to raise a family. The only thing better than living on Georgian Bay with a Western exposure is living on Georgian Bay with an Eastern exposure. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess as you get older, you're an early riser. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're not there yet. No. Uh, good for you. Good for you. I'll get even. <laughs> Your other interest, Wayne. Oh, no, this is, this is, the, this is the shore. This is the shore. Yeah, yep. yeah this is the, the lunch on the shore. We've had a few Caesars in our day yeah. on yeah. the shore. That's great. Now, Wayne, you have an interest in... <laughs> in blowing your hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is our current, just out for us, just out getting gas in our current boat at 60 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I always asked you when I first came here for a yeah. ride in your boat, because you had one that was pretty quick, if I remember. I did, I did, and I never took you, did I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad now I didn't. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, we talked about that many times, mm -hmm. but it just never worked out. You were always too busy, I think. Golf season, I never had time off in the know, golf season. I know, yeah. And, and there's an aspect of boating that's <laughs> shown here, and that's the snacks. Yeah. <laughs> snacks on the back of the boat. That's great. Do you, do you know where that is? Do you know where you're anchored? That's uh, inside Giant's Tomb. I is it? That day, probably with our friends uh, Glenn and Judy Howard, normally their son Scott Howard and his wife, uh, wife to be Kelly, and uh, who else is normally with us? Yeah. The oh, Joe Rooney yeah. and Carly Howard. There's a Howard familiarity in all these stories I've told. Yeah, the Howard long time. To, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The Howard seem to find their way through this. Yeah. <laughs> you two do a lot of traveling. Tell us some of the places you've been and some of the places you want to go. Well, we've done a lot of traveling separate um, in our curling lives, <laughs> um, and now we're starting to enjoy traveling together, which is fantastic. Yeah but we've pretty much traveled the world. Yeah, just February, last February, I, th I flew completely around the world in February. Wow. Last yeah. February, yeah. So I spent a few hours sitting in an airplane last February, yeah. but uh, with coaching in Europe, uh, two weeks a month, I was somewhere with the team, which could be anywhere. We did a lot of our training in Switzerland. Uh, we spent time in Sweden, but we've been lucky enough to do um, different things now in our life. Uh, again, uh, we talk about Glenn Howard. We did his retirement party. Pebble Beach, Napa, Sonoma. 
Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty good things. We've been lucky to go to St. Andrews a few times. Um, yeah. But we, have, we love to travel. And, and it's, that bug is rubbed off on our children who are now, like I say, all over the place. Uh, our oldest daughters actually worked in Africa, in Ghana, Africa, for three months. Wow. Went over there as part good of her, her university degree. So she's been over to Africa twice now. And uh, yeah. our other daughters, same thing. Just They both love to travel. And uh, I think it's one of the best educations you can get in the world is uh, seeing other cultures, learning from other people. Yeah. There's, there's so much out there than in the world. So two questions for each of you. What's your favorite place you've been? And where do you most want to go? Oh, my goodness. Um, I can honestly say I was in Japan curling. I absolutely loved that country. Mm -hmm. Switzerland's a beautiful, beautiful country. Um, we've been lucky enough to tour around and, and golfed um, a few places in Canada. We're going to Whistler in June, which I'm excited about. Um, would love to go to Italy. Have not been to mm -hmm. Italy. Mm -hmm. I would love to cruise the Mediterranean down there on a, on a big boat. I think that would be just one of the most unique experiences in the world. Yeah, recruit, you know what a big boat is in the Mediterranean? 140. Though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know, but I just can't. It's not on my snack. Plan. We love to tell a story that we were in Monaco up high looking down on boats coming into the harbor. And we thought we saw our boat coming into the harbor. <laughs> and when we, so we went running down to meet it when it tied up. It was gonna, it's exciting. You know, here we are in Monaco and our boat. We got there and it was 60 feet longer than our boat. <laughs> <laughs> you were that high up. Yeah. Perspective. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bit humbling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's look ahead. Sherry, what's the future hold for you? Uh, well, I hope the future, um, lots of health so that we can continue to travel. Um, we are, we're just starting to experience life more together. Um, mm -hmm. we've done a lot. Our second year of empty nesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So we are, we're, we are like pretty much, I think how many trips a year do we, you know, we, a lot. yeah, as many as we can do. Exactly. Yeah. But you know, we need to stay healthy for that. Yeah. Yeah. And what's uh, the future hold for you? Uh, hopefully, uh, you know what, I, I wouldn't mind taking a run at another Olympics with a team. Uh, if Team Hasselberg called me back in a couple of years when they're done having babies and wanted to... Oh, yeah, we have to talk about that. Yeah, yeah you're not doing that now because they all got pregnant. Three of, the, three of the four of them got pregnant and one of them, the other one moved to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, this year was a not ideal year, so uh, no. we, we took a break from each other in the nicest way yeah. to put it, and uh, we'll see where things end up in a couple of years. So, yeah. uh, Have you been approached by other teams, or would you be approached by other teams, or do you want to wait for them if they're... I've put it out there that I'm Team Hasselberg's coach still, okay. so people pretty much leave me alone. Yeah. That way, yeah. yeah, interesting. I know that, that staying healthy is important to both of you. Do you have workout regimes? <laughs> no, I think we just, you know, I think everything in moderation is what we always say, you know. Except um, dinner tonight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for dinner tonight. Yeah. yeah. But that's, yeah, everything in moderation. Yeah, we, you know, you. we enjoy a cocktail, but we're not, uh, we're not going to have 10 or 12 in a night. Yeah. We, yeah. we, you know, we, we walk every day. We walk four or five kilometers every day. And try um, and eat healthy, we, but, but know, stay but active. Occasionally we have a burger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. You have to live. <laughs> yeah. And what about the girls? What do you see in the future for them? Well, Kelly, our oldest, is engaged and getting married October 4th, 2024. 24, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's looking forward to that. Uh, maybe grandbabies in the future. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So maybe a bit too early to say that, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we just, you know, we, we, we love where we live and we hope that they come back to it. Yes. Um, I mean, who doesn't want to come back to Georgian Bay? So we... I was just going to say, being on the water is a yeah, pretty good incentive exactly. to bring them back. Yeah. 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 And the younger one, what's, what's the future? Emily, uh, she's 21, living in Guelph and uh, working with animals, which is her passion. Um, still involved with sports and... You know, thank, thankfully, they're still curling, so we can interject ourselves into their lives, yes. growing up and watching. And, yeah. you know, it, it's hard when, you know, they've moved away from home and you just want them to come back. Yeah. And she's the one that you mentioned to us, uh, worked at uh, the Y Marsh for a while. The older one. Yeah. The older well, one. Well, and, and Emily did a little bit, too, in did camps. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. <laughs> yes. But you're right. Yeah. Kelly, our oldest one, and, and she's in outdoor uh, education right now in Pembroke. She loves right. the outdoors. And what will that lead to? I, I think her and her fiance would love to maybe move out east, um, rural, 
stay involved. They love camping. They love the outdoors. He's involved in the golf industry. So who knows where it's going to lead again. We just, you know, want them to be happy and healthy. Yeah. Yeah, he's on the superintendent side. Yes. Grass or everything else. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and for, for two girls who would not play golf, no matter how hard I dragged them to the golf course, right. for one of them to end up with somebody in the golf industry is, yeah. full, is fully entertaining yeah. for yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Of course. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, just one more question, and that, that has to do with, I think you've told me about the outdoor education and what it will lead to. That's the older girl. Correct. What's the career aspiration of the younger girl? She loves animals. We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> yeah, she's taking 21 a 21-year-old girl. Yeah, she's taking a break from school <laughs> yeah. um, and working in the adult field. She's working at a, a, a lab. Uh, they do research on oh, pet food. Yeah. She, so right now she's yeah. doing animal care yeah. and some lab work. So, yeah, she... COVID chased her out of university, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, yeah from a too bad. Zoology to just couldn't hack it in. Again, yeah. COVID was, unfortunately, yeah. it's, it's affected us all in different ways. Yeah, but she worked at Animal, yeah. animal Lion Safari yeah. uh, last summer and now working in an animal lab. So, loves animals. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm just going to uh, thank some folks, and then I'm going to come back and thank you. So, don't go anywhere. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but uh, we do want to thank our friends at uh, Rogers TV who uh, are videotaping this program. I want to thank the staff of the Midland Cultural Center, particularly uh, Glenn Irwin, who is our uh, technical support, our audiovisual guy. Thanks also to Michelle Fair, who does the marketing and promotion for this program. We really want to thank our sponsors. This program is made possible by community businesses who want to keep this building open and keep providing opportunities like this for you. So uh, I, I do. Uh, Michelle and, and Jeff, thank you very much for what you've done, and pass our thanks all, along to Kathy as well. Uh, they have a, a financial advice business called RBC Dominion Securities. They provide wealth management services and strategic advice to clients. Our program sponsor, well, you know who you are, Penetanguishing Curling Club, Midland Curling Club. Uh, we have a team of folks, um, Rod Ferguson, John Farragher, Lorianne Clancy, Dora Sloan, Brian McHale, Jen Parker, Jonathan Wallace, those people uh, meet the morning after this program to tell me what I did wrong the night before. <laughs> those of you who are here in the uh, audience will meet you in the atrium if you want to say hello to Sherry and Wayne. Uh, our television audience, we hope that you have enjoyed this. Thank you for watching, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a good night. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Fred. program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. kid living at home with my dad. But now, I'm in Rome. That's where dad met Francesca. So your stepmom is really Francesca Fortuna. Oh, and did I mention Francesca is her pop starring at Kika? And who knows, maybe one day I could be a pop star too. For now, I'm gonna make the best of it. Beautiful city. Home Sweet Rome premieres Friday, April 7th at 7 on Family.
Focus better. Partner better. Sleep better. Breathe better. Love better. Work better. Friend better. Unwind better. Everything gets better when you get active. You're watching Rogers TV, Midland.